brand new episode of the Satisfied God Podcast. Raven Bird with you once more. Such a pleasure to uh, be able to do this uh, each time and to know that you're out there listening and are telling others about this podcast. Thanks for doing that. Thanks to you who are helping me to do that, helping this to continue with your financial support, your prayers. So, so grateful for that. Uh, All of you who have, you know, reached out financially and helped. It means a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you for your communications, whether it's text or phone calls or anything that you do to let me know that these things, these means of communication with you are actually benefiting you. Thanks for doing that. It is an encouragement and I appreciate you reaching out and letting me know. This is going to be a uh, episode uh, where we focus on the Known of God series that we have been putting up uh, regularly. Today we're going to focus on the thought of covenant. The concept of this podcast, as you all know, who've been listening for a while, is to present to you the anchor that holds our soul perpetually in place. As far as relationship with God, as far as a state of being that is certain, I desire to point you to the anchor, the one who keeps your soul secured in place unmoved because your soul's anchoring is determined by the certainty of him and not you Christ and not us and that's what I hope this is doing so today will be no different and today we're going to talk about covenant the certainty the security of the soul in the light of covenant relationship with God in the light of covenant And we're going to do that by focusing on the seed, focusing on the promises of God being sure in and to a seed. And as Galatians says, that seed who is Christ. So I will not go any further uh, to try to explain that. You will hear that during the teaching. So um, we'll keep that there. I am sorry for the... uh, the tardiness of this. I've been on the road um, taking my um, mother-in-law back to South Carolina and spent a couple days with my dad and visited him. And um, so this has gone up a little, a little late and I apologize for that, but I do hope it's a blessing without any further ado, guys. Amen. All right. Welcome to our class tonight. We are, um, <clears throat> Continuing our look at the series Known of God. In these classes, we've just ended kind of an extended look at uh, two episodes in the history of Israel that seem to demonstrate the key component that we've been focused on in this series. And that is that God's relation to His people in the series of course in the in the testimony we're dealing with his his view his relating to his knowledge of his people Israel but we must bring that into present time into the day where it is his relation to us as believers those who are born again those who are in his son those in whom his son dwells But I think we've been looking at this, and we've called it many things during this. We've called it the simplicity of Christ, the singleness, the exclusivity of God's view, the simplicity of God's perspective with regard to the whole, to the body, to the church. And we've been talking about that, and we've looked at Korah, and we've looked at Aaron's rod, and then we looked at Adonijah and how Adonijah stood in opposition to the king that the father knew was the rightful one to stand upon the throne, and then in the recognition of his kingship in the land, there was a judgment brought into Adonijah, or to Adonijah, 
And that judgment is absolutely true. That judgment is what works in our heart. And it, it works in the recognition of the king, the rightful king. There is a judgment that comes when the rightful king takes is, is recognized in the land. And it is just this. One sits upon the throne. And you are not that one. There is one who has right to the place. There is one the Father sees and knows to be the king and to rule and to govern. There is no question of that. The only question is the revelation of that that the Father already knows to be so. The revelation of the mind and faith of the Father in the land. And we dealt with that, and that happened in Korah as well, and that, all, all the things, and, and also in the rod of Aaron. And you can go back into those previous classes and look at those, look, look at those things. But I think it presses the point that God has one, he has chosen one to stand before him, one who has right to stand in his sight. And in his sight be his knowing and his relation to the whole. And it is that that I want to continue with. Because that is what secures us. That is the security, the sureness, the certainty of our state of being. So... When we started these classes, one of the things I said we would focus on, or basically the point of starting these classes, is to scripturally focus on the certainty, the security of our salvation, the certainty and the security of our relationship with God, so that we would at least scripturally observe that our relation with God or His relationship to us is not, has no variables. It is settled, it is secured, and what I wanted to do was to, to present where it is settled, where it is secured, or I could say in whom it is settled and in whom it is secured. For there is a true anchor for the soul, whether your soul is cognizant of it or not, there is an anchor that has been given To your soul, there is an anchor that secures your soul in reality. And the Hebrew writer in chapter 6 of Hebrews will define that as the one who stands in the holiest of all. He is the anchor of the soul. He who stands in the holiest of all, we've looked at all of that in previous classes, is the anchor. So we dealt with those things, and and the focus of it is to basically scripturally demonstrate, scripturally present Him as the anchor. Him as the sureness of the covenant. The sureness of our relation, or God's relation with us. God's knowledge of us. So I started all th- uh, that all things regarding God's relation to us and subsequently our relation to God is governed by one thing, and that's covenant. We could say the covenant. And that covenant not only expressly beholds the rightful party of the relationship, but it forbids all others. It excludes all strangers and all parties who are not party to the covenant. Because that covenant is defined in the face of one man. And that's what we've been seeing throughout throughout these lessons. I made reference in, in certain classes uh, in many times that there's several places throughout in the old Testament where God says, I will make my covenant with so and so. I will make my covenant with them. And this demonstrates something that is important to this study. And that's why I emphasized it before and I'm bringing it back for, for a reason tonight. 
his knowing of us, and this phrase implies it, more than implies it, God brings man into a covenant that he already possesses. A covenant that is already sure. A covenant that's already cut and fixed and certified and ratified, already in force. He does not bring you into a covenant that leaves you as a party that determines how sure and how perfect the covenant is or how well it will be kept. He brings you into a covenant that is ex- eternally kept because it's kept by himself, in himself. He is the keeping of the covenant. He is the security of the matter. The phrase implies that God brings us into a covenant he already possesses, a a covenant secured in himself that was secured and is secured before he ever brings a man into it because it shows that man is not the means of the covenant, nor is he the one that secures and substantiates its perpetuity. It is that perpetual certainty of God's relation to us in light of the covenant that I want to talk about tonight. And that we've been really talking about throughout these classes, but I want to deal with it tonight in a, in a very pointed way. And it has to do with what I have on the board here. And this is very familiar, of course. This comes from many places in the uh, this is referring to many different places in the scripture, but Galatians chapter 3 says it this way, Thy seed who is Christ, speaking of a covenant made, a promise made to, to the seed. And he said, not seeds as of many, but to thy seed who is Christ. And I want to stress that tonight so that we can at least scripturally see, because we're going to look at a lot of different places, a lot of different verses, but mostly in one one of Paul's letters. But several verses we're going to look at that talks about this, and talks about the security of the covenant in the seed. And there's been many misapplications, misunderstandings with regard to this, and I want to look at it tonight uh, for, for, for a while. So I want to deal with this. You remember uh, in previous classes, many classes ago, we dealt with the covenant that God had made with Abraham in Genesis 15. And I, I'm not going to reteach that tonight, but I just want to point some things out about it and just go through. You can go, I think it's maybe class number four or class number five where we, we dealt with it a little. But if you remember, you recall, uh, Abram, Abram at that time said to God, you have given me no seed. And God began to speak to him about the seed. And that he would, his seed would be great and increase greatly and that the seed would possess the land and possess great substance. But before that, well, during that explanation that God was giving him about the seed, Abram asked a question. And he asked, how shall I know all these things will be given? How shall I know all of these things will be done? What, what can I hold to as a certainty that these things will be done as you say? And something very important happens As an answer to this question, God's not ignoring, because it may seem like it, but God is not ignoring his question. God is is answering his question as to the certainty of the promise to the seed. How will I know this will take place? So God says, in response again to, to the question, he tells him to go get animals for sacrifice. And he tells him to cut those animals in in two and then put them one against another, creating a path in between them. And as he did this, 
And he, you know, Abram does what he was commanded to do, and then God begins to tell him again about the seed, about what would happen. He even goes into the seed would be slaves in land, talking about their slavery in Egypt. And then they would come out of the land with great substance at the fullness of time, and, or at the time appointed, and they would come out possessing great substance and all of those things. But What's important is understanding that God's promise and the certainty of this promise to the seed has to be inseparably bound to the sacrifices that Abram sacrificed. He cut these animals asunder and created this pathway between their, their halves. So it all has to, what I'm saying is, Everything with regard to the promises made to the seed are inseparable to the cross. That, that's what the sacrifices represent. It's inseparable to the cross. And what I'm telling you is that the thing, the thing that happens later in that story that's such a perplexing picture further elaborates on the fact that it is the cross that makes this promise sure to the seed. It is the cross, the sacrifice, the blood that certifies and makes certain the promise to the seed and that it would all be sure to the seed. Again, in answering Abram's question. So, as God tells him more about the seed, suddenly Abram goes, Abram goes into a deep sleep. God puts Abram into a deep sleep. And God begins to tell him more about the seed. And then the sun goes down and it becomes dark. And here's, here's one, here's just a perplexing picture. It, it confused me for, for a long, long time. When it gets dark and he's, he's in this deep sleep, he beholds these two entities. He calls a, um, a smoking furnace or a pot of fire and a burning lamp or a burning torch that's passing together between those pieces of the animals. This is called a cutting of a covenant. And these two objects are walking together through the pieces of the animals, cutting a covenant together. And we've covered this before and, and stated that this is a beautiful picture of the father and the son walking together, just like we have basically stated in those words, <coughs> with Abram. Abraham at that time and Isaac going to the mountain where Isaac would be sacrificed and it says the two walk together. Well, this is the picture of the father and the son walking together, cutting a covenant by blood, a blood covenant, cutting the covenant together. And you're seeing all of this culminating in the sacrifice of the cross because here's where the seed, here's where it's sure, here's where it's all made sure, made perfect, certain to the seed. Why? We'll look at it. So they're confirming the covenant together, walking through these pieces. And Abraham, in seeing this, is seeing the answer to his question, how can this be certain? And now the answer is basically revealed to him now, notice again. We pointed this out in the in the class we did on this that Abram's not part of the cutting of the covenant. That God does not reach over, take Abram by the hand, and they walk through together. He is not a party to the cutting or the ratifying or the security or securing of the covenant. He beholds the covenant being made sure, being certified. He is not a party to it. It doesn't depend upon him at all. It is done by the Father and the Son, and only the Father and the Son. 
And that's just a wonderful thing. And then it says, after he sees that, the same day that he sees this, the same day God makes covenant with Abram. And basically it's that God has shown him the covenant, and then God brings him into a covenant already cut. A covenant already sure and made certain in the seed. The father and the seed walk together. God has confirmed it to the seed. God and the seed it's, it's sure now in this cutting of a covenant. Now, again, I don't want to get into that very, very, very much. So I want to take this a little, this picture that we just talked about in Genesis 15, I want to take that a little further. I've never gotten away from this thought. This has been kind of the overreaching, overarching theme of the whole thing. But I just want to go a little further and examine something with regard to the to this covenant or to the new covenant in relation to how God relates to us because this was the thing that governed God's relation to Israel or basically his relation to man throughout the testimony but focusing on Israel to a great degree and and Abram which well out of the increase of that seed that fell into the ground with Isaac, basically the harvest of that was Israel is my son. Basically that seed in increase. But I I want us to look at this. The certainty of our salvation rests upon its being confirmed to and in one seed. And, of course, this takes us back to our beginning verses that we've read uh, recently, and we read throughout the beginning of this class in Galatians 4, 9. But you have to, and we're going to go back into those verses in some of these classes to come, but the context of those verses, the context of Galatians 4 and 9, has to be, it, you have to see those verses in the context of, of, of Galatians 3 where he begins to talk about the seed. It has everything to do with the seed who is Christ. The seed governed everything as to God's dealing with man. And if you read Galatians in the context of this or in, in, in the awareness of that, You'll, it, will, it will revolutionize how you see the letter because you'll see that the seed governs everything of the letter to the Galatians. When he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. This is a soul living in the recognition of or the revealed knowledge of the one seed. The one seed who is the possessor of all fullness. The seed who is made unto Paul and lives in Paul as everything that he assumed he already possessed under the Mosaic Covenant. Yet in the light of this seed, the seed of promise, Paul realized that the old covenant, its procedures, its provisions, its promises were merely declaring the seed who would come. It was not declaring people being righteous. It was declaring the righteous seed who would dwell in people and be made unto those people everything they were incapable of being. And in that, being made unto them the fullness of the promise of God, being made unto them the sureness of the promise and the fullness of the covenant and the reality of the inheritance. In the holy and righteous seed, Paul finds, and he possesses all the promises. And he's now declaring to the church the foolishness, the futility of ever attempting to know or to find the fullness of the promised inheritance outside of the seed unto whom they all pertain. All of the things of the covenant, all the promises, the inheritance, 
All of it belonged to one seed. Paul came to realize that when that one seed, that one son was revealed in him. Reality was not about Paul. Spiritual substance was not found in Paul. It was all found in the one who lived in Paul. It was him being made unto Paul spiritual fullness, spiritual reality, the blessing of the covenant. And in that recognition of that one seed, in the revealing of that one seed, as he says in Galatians, he was blessed with faithful Abraham. He come to the full blessing that was promised to Abraham by faith. And we'll look at that as we go tonight. Now, let's go to a verse. I'll start reading some of these verses that I want to look at. Um, Romans. Chapter 4, we're going to stay in Romans most of the time tonight. And again, this is, this is Paul in Romans 4. He's talking about Abraham, and he's talking about the faith of Abraham. But let's, let's, read, let's read these verses. There's, there's a certain verse I want to look at with you. I'm trying to figure out where to start here. For the promise, this is verse 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, then faith is made void, and the promise is made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, There is no transgression. Therefore, it, the promise, the blessings, the promise, the inheritance. Therefore, it is a faith. Everything with regard to this salvation that he's declaring here, the salvation that is by faith, everything of it is a faith. That it may be by grace. This is King James. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to that which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. And we'll stop there. And then he goes on and speaks of him staggering not at the promise of God, through unbelief, he was strong in faith, and he was, he looked, at the King James, and I'm not going to get off on this, but <clears throat> the King James says here in verse 19, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, and that would, that could bring some confusion. It's actually he considered his body dead, worthless, unable to produce what God had, had promised. He couldn't get it done. And he considered fully, if you read it in more literal translations, you can see he he intently considered the fact that his body was now dead because he was 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was dead and could not produce the promise of God. He knew that was so, he, he, and he basically, Paul would say, he gloried in the fact he could not produce this. Now we know what is not addressed here did happen, but Paul is addressing the faith. And the faith was always that God was able to do it because God is the one who promised it. And it was all around the seed. So so shall thy seed be, verse 18 and and all of that. But let me go back to verse 16 because that's where I want to focus. It, uh, this, this is from the Young's literal translation. I'm going to read it from that. Because of this, it is a faith, again, the promise and the fullness of the promise. It is a faith that is according to grace, that it may be according to grace, for the promise being sure to all the seed. 
not to that which is of the law only, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham. This is a tremendous verse, and I I don't know if I can even do justice in, in explaining it, but there's something wonderful being presented in this verse. Everything of salvation, everything of our relation to God and His relation to us is a faith, and it must be known, it must be realized, it must be apprehended by faith. Because it is all in accordance with the grace that God has given. The the grace that God has given can only be realized and experienced by faith. Faith is not wishing, hoping. Faith is the soul beholding Christ as the substance and the evidence and the perfection and the substance of all spiritual reality. Faith is God's view being revealed and made known in my soul. So this has to be a faith because it has to be faith accessing a grace that has been given. That's verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. It It has to be faith accessing the grace that God has provided. In that, he has provided the soul with the one seed. Now, let me me read some of the things I wrote here. The gift of grace he has given to the soul must be apprehended by faith. Let's examine something that makes this even more tremendous. It it seems, when you read it in the King James, and it does say it very well here in in the Young's Literal, but when you read it in the King James, it's like, it's, it's by faith that it may be by grace so that it can finally become sure to the seed. The Young's Literal says this, It is a faith that it may be according or in accordance with the grace of God. For the promise being sure, this is an active, present word in the Greek. It is not futuristic. It's not that someday it shall be sure to the seed. No, it's talking about something that's already sure to the seed, sure to all the seed. This is important because this is exactly what the grace of God has done. This is the reality of grace. The grace has provided something sure to the soul. And it, because it hasn't provided something to the soul that I am now responsible of keeping or making good or keeping good or whatever, it has given the seed himself to my soul as the sureness of salvation, as the sureness of the covenant. Therefore, it is faith that has to access that grace because the promises are already sure to the seed. So if you're going to know the sureness of the covenant and the sureness of the promises and the sureness of your relationship to God, you must by faith apprehend the grace that has been given to your soul in the very presence of the seed himself that lives in it. Because he is the sureness of the promises in you. He is the sureness of the covenant in you because the covenant is sure to him and in him. Again, go back to Genesis 15 with the cutting of the covenant with the seed, the father and the son. It's sure. It is faith that accesses this grace that has given to the soul the one perfect incorruptible seed unto whom all the promises are are sure, and in whom all the promises are yes and amen. Paul here is speaking the fact that the only thing we can boast in is this grace of God that has been given. He's speaking of grace being accessed by faith. 
Faith beholding the promises as sure and certain in the person of the one seed who is the gift of grace to the soul. But as testified of and as designed by God, it must be by faith in accordance with the grace that has been given. Because nothing of this promise, nothing of the reality of the covenant can be realized or received or partaken of except in the one seed himself. This is Jesus looking at the Pharisees and declaring unto them, The Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I reveal him to whosoever I will reveal him. That's a relationship exclusive to the Father and the Son. A relationship that all their religious observance could not produce for them. What must they do? Come unto me. This relationship belongs to me. The blessings of the covenant are mine. All things have been delivered or given unto me of my Father. All the promises, all the blessings of the covenant, everything you think are your promises are mine, and I am now in possession of them. Come unto me. I will give rest to the soul that is weary and laboring to achieve and produce and get what I already am and by grace will be unto you. It's this mercy God has given, this grace God has provided that must be accessed by faith because the promise is sure. To the seed. And if you are going to know anything of the fullness of the promise or the covenant of your salvation, of your relation to God, you must know it in the seed himself who is Christ in you. That's your salvation. Measured, defined, secured in one seed who is your very life unto God. That's good news. That's, that's good news. There is nothing of this dependent upon you or upon me. Not even the faith that accesses such a glorious grace. That faith is God's working in me, His own view, His own mind. The person of the faith that the whole economy of the law, the whole testimony pointed to the coming of the faith Himself. Who is Christ in you. And your soul becomes a partaker of the glorious riches of the promised inheritance. The glorious riches of the blessings that were promised. Because your soul is partaking of him as the fullness of the blessing. It's a reality that is found in one seed. It is, it is found in that seed. That incorruptible seed. And if you are born of the incorruptible seed. The seed unto whom the promise is sure is in you. The seed who is the sureness and certification of our relation to God is in us. Nothing of it can be experienced or realized separate from the seed who is in you. That's that's all I'm trying to say during this class tonight. They stumbled at that stumbling block. That very simple thing, yet that very simple thing, that very singular issue offended them because they wanted something of their own. They wanted to possess something that only belonged to the one seed. And he would be made unto them All of the blessings of the covenant, all of the promises of God realized and fulfilled, if they would merely come to Him. Coming to Him was basically walking away from their assumed possession. Their assumed possession of a righteousness that was of the law, which is not a righteousness at all. It pointed to righteousness. That's why Paul goes on and further qualifies this by writing, 
And these, these are, this is the end of verse 16. The promise is sure to, the, to all the seed, all the seed. Don't think. Again, let's, we have to read these things. He's not changing his mind when he writes different letters. Thy seed who is Christ. So when you read all the seed, you have to realize he's still speaking of the seed himself. That seed living in us. That seed being made unto all. The fullness of the covenant. The blessings promised. And it's sure to all the seed because it's sure to those who are born of that seed. It's sure to those in whom the seed himself dwells. And that's why it goes on to further clarify this and he says not to that only which is of the law but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham now this can be very troubling for some people and it has been and it's the backbone of a school of thought a theology called dual covenant theology but these verses are not a stand or an endorsement of dual covenant theology. Dual covenant theology says the Jews have their covenant with God by the law, and then we who are believers have our covenant with God, and they're both valid covenants. They're both valid, and they both get us to the same end. That's absurd. The thing that they believe Paul is saying, exact, he's saying exactly the opposite of that. He's not saying, oh, well, the, those under the law are cool, and, and we're, you know, we who have come to Christ, we're, we're good too. I mean, we're all, we're all have a valid covenant with God. That's not what he's saying. He's actually removing Jew and Gentile from the argument entirely. It's an argument about the sureness of the promise, the sureness of the covenant being embodied in one seed who by grace has been given to the soul, whether it is Jew or Gentile, bringing them into a relationship with God that is not determined or measured by either one of those fleshly distinctions. It's determined and secured in the sufficiency of one seed. With whom God's covenant was cut. And we'll read in in Galatians 3 here in a second that it was cut before, confirmed of God before in Christ. Therefore, he's not giving credence to the distinctions of Jews and Greeks and saying they all have a valid relationship with God. Paul is actually removing those distinctions altogether from the argument. And he is cementing the entire thing in the certainty, the spiritual certainty of the seed himself who will live in and be the life of those who may have been born as Jews or Gentiles. He's bringing them into the sureness of the covenant and he's saying the the covenant is sure in one seed. And it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. Your relation to God remains sure and remains the same. Because it is not dependent upon you. It is not measured or determined by you. It is measured by the seed who is in you. It's about one seed. Galatians 3, if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs, according to the promise. You can't be heirs in accordance to the promise unless you are Christ's. They were trying to be heirs in opposition to the promise, but the promise was always in view of the seed because the promise was unto the seed. So unless you're Christ, which means you are born of that seed, the seed lives in you, you cannot be heirs in accordance to the promise. You are trying to possess an inheritance, possess a blessing that is in absolute opposition to the promise. Because the promise was made to one seed, not to many, but to one. Not to you and me, but to the one who lives in you and me. 
Galatians 3. This is uh, verses 11 through verses uh, 29. I want to read it in the King James and the... um, And the Young's Literal, but I think I'm just going to read the Young's Literal. You can follow me in the King James if you want, if that will help you. Let's start in verse 12. And the law is not by faith, but the man who did them shall live in them. This is basically Paul saying he can't. He's posing an impossibility of man living perfectly, fulfilling perfectly the law. You may fulfill the letter of the law, but you can never fulfill the intention. You can do what it says on paper or on stone, but you cannot be the one of whom it speaks. He's going to go on and say this. The law is not by faith. The man who did them shall live in them. Christ did redeem us from the curse of the law, having become for us a curse. Again, bringing in the sacrifice, bringing in the cross. For he... It hath been written, Cursed is everyone who is hanging on a tree, that to the nations the blessing of Abraham may come in Christ Jesus. Now, you you can't get it said much clearer than that. So that the blessing of Abraham may come in Christ Jesus. Nowhere else. Because he's the seed unto whom it was all made. And he's going to go on and say that. That the promise of the Spirit may we may receive through the faith. Brethren, as a man, I say, even of a man, a con- even of man, a confirmed covenant, no one makes void or doth add to it. And to Abraham were the promises spoken to his seed. He doth not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, a covenant confirmed before by God to Christ. There was a covenant confirmed before. Something sure. So that the law that came 430 years after that doth not set aside to make void the promise. Go back to Genesis and then that's what he's talking about. Could not make void the promise. For if the law be, for if by the law be the inheritance, it is no more by promise, but to Abraham through promise God granted it. Why then the law? On account of the transgressions it was added, till the seed might come to which the promise hath been made. Having been set in order through messengers in the hand of a mediator, and the mediator is not of one, and God is one. The law then is against the promises of God, let it not be. For if a law was given that was able to make alive or give the life of which it spoke, law by law would have been the righteousness. But the writing, the scripture, the law, did shut up the whole of man under sin, the whole under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ may may be given to those believing. And before the coming of the faith under law, we were kept shut up to the faith that was about to be revealed, so that the law became our child conductor to Christ, that by faith we may be declared righteous. And the faith having come, no more under a child conductor are we, for ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as to Christ were baptized, did put on Christ. Listen to this. There is not, now this is the Young's Little, there is not here, speaking of in Christ, speaking of in the seed. 
None of the distinctions here. Because he's showing how the whole thing was about the seed coming. The whole thing was to the seed, it was about the seed, and it was waiting on the coming of the seed, and now that seed has come. And in that seed, there is, not here, (laughs) I love the way it's said there, not here, not in this seed, not in this man, there is, not here, Jew or Greek, there is not here, servant or free man, there is not here, male or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are of Christ, then of Abraham you are seed, and according to the promise, heirs. Not here. None of that's found here. Why? Because only he's found here. The promise was not made to many. It was not made to Jews and Gentiles, not made to male or female. It wasn't made to a Christian or a good Christian or a bad Christian, a Christian at this level or a Christian at this level. It wasn't made to a mature Christian and not to a, 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 a Christian that was just born again two seconds ago. It was made to the seed who lives in that believer. Now, there is ever-growing, ever-comprehending, ever-living in a greater and more perfect awareness in the light of His appearing, the fullness of that seed and everything He means and everything He is, and the blessing and the promise that He represents and brings to the soul. But guess what? The moment that believer is born again, that seed and all of the fullness and the promise and the fullness of the promise that He brings in and as Himself is present in you. But as long as He is not known and not beheld and your soul is not seeing that seed, you're going to think that the promises, the inheritance, the blessings, the covenant, all the things are still lacking, still missing, and there's something still that needs to be done to make it so. The only thing that needs to be done to make it so is the eyes of your heart open to see the seed who makes it sure, who is the sureness of it. The whole thing wrapped man in a sphere of sin and said, You are sin. You fall short. You are not Him. And it did that to protect the covenant to the one it belonged to, for the one it belonged to. And it said to that man who was in that sphere of sin and death, you need to be born of that seed. That seed needs to be your life. That seed who is to come, He needs to live in you and be made unto you all things. And if He is not, you will not partake of the promise. If He is not, you will not know the blessings of the covenant because it all is contingent upon Him. You understand? That's why the cross, all of the things, has to govern and is the undergirding reality of this covenant being secured to the seed. Go back to Genesis 15. Not only that, but there's a wonderful thing about the word promise here. This is from the Calvin, Calvin's commentary, John Calvin's commentary. He says, it's a figure of speech in Galatians 3.22 when he speaks of the promise in which the thing containing is put for the thing contained. Which means when he says promise, he's not just talking about a promise for something to come. He's saying that he encompasses all of it in the word promise. He means the declaration of the promise and the content of the promise. Meaning, if you are in Christ and the seed is in you, and by that presence of the seed you are an heir in accordance to the promise, then in that seed... In His presence, Him dwelling in your soul, you don't just possess another promise or that promise yet to be fulfilled. You possess that promise, but you possess that promise in its full content, in its fullness. You possess the content of the promise. You possess the content 
that was promised because you possess the seed who is the content of the promise. He has made unto your soul everything contained in the promise. He has made unto your soul all the blessings promised to Abraham. So in the seed we are blessed with faithful Abraham. We have come to everything he looked for by faith. Everything he anticipated that was to come. Let's, let's go to another place. And it shows to me, and it demonstrates this, this verse, and we're in Romans still. This is Romans chapter 9. And he talks about his, his heaviness. This is at the beginning of chapter 9. His heaviness, heaviness for and sorrow in his heart for his brethren, the Israelites. I'm reading these from the uh, Young's Literal Translation. I'm going to read a lot of this, maybe the whole chapter. But it all, listen to the first part and then you'll, you, you can understand where we're going to go in this chapter 9 here. Listen to this. Paul says, I have great heaviness of heart and sorrow in my heart for wish that I could be accursed or anathema for their sake. Who are Israelites, whose is the adoption and the glory and the covenant and the law giving and the service and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed to the ages. Amen. And it is not possible that the word of God hath failed for not all who are of Israel are these Israel. Nor because they are seed of Abraham, natural seed, or all children. But in, this is important, in Isaac shall a seed be called to thee. That is, the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Same argument as Galatians 3. They are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned or recognized for, and I like it, in the seed. In Isaac your seed are called, are named, are recognized. The children of the promise are reckoned or recognized in the seed. For the word of promise is this, according to this time I will come, and there shall be to Sarah a son, and not only so, but also Rebekah, having conceived by one Isaac our father, for they being not yet born, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to choice or election, might remain or stand, not of works, but of him who is calling. Meaning, His determination, his purpose, was never determined by the acts of these people, good or evil. His purpose was determined by his choosing of one son. His choosing an election of one. And he goes on and says this, The greater shall serve the less, according as it hath been written, Jacob I did love, Esau I did hate. Remember, we dealt with that in earlier classes. In Malachi chapter 1, God says, I have loved you. And the question is, how have you loved us? And he quotes that very thing. Do you not know Jacob have I loved, Esau I have hated. Basically, my love for you is that I have loved one son and hated everything else. That I have, my love is unto one. My love is confirmed and sure unto one son and nothing and no one else. I'm telling you, that's beautiful. <laughs> Goes on in Romans 9, verse 22. And if God willing to show the wrath and to make known his power did endure in much long suffering vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of kindness or mercy, that he before prepared for glory, whom also he did call us, not only out of Jews, but also out of nations. Why? Because it doesn't matter. Because his calling is all about one son, one seed. The invitation is to be found in one. 
be defined, named in one. Also in Hosea he saith, I will call what is not my people, my people, and her not beloved, beloved. And it shall be in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah doth cry concerning Israel, if the number of the sons of Israel may be as the sands of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. And for a matter he is finishing and is cutting short in righteousness, because a matter cut short will the Lord do upon the land. And according as Isaiah saith before, except the Lord of of Sabbath, or the Lord of hosts, did leave to us a seed. Listen to that. Remember, this is all about the promise. Everything about the seed. It's not the natural seed. It's not those who are born of the lineage, the descendants of natural descendants of Abraham. <coughs> Abraham. In Isaac, the seed is called. The children of promise are reckoned in a seed. And according as Isaiah saith before, he's bringing this to a spiritual Fulfillment and conclusion. Except the Lord did leave to us a seed, we had become as Sodom and as Gomorrah we had been like. What did he say? If it wasn't for the seed, we would be destroyed. I, I sat and pondered that for a long time. It's a very sobering thing to think. Not only for them, we're not just throwing this off and saying, oh, Paul's talking about the Jews. No, he's talking about you. He's talking about you and he's talking about me with regard to our relation to God, our salvation. If God had not left us a seed, if this thing was not always about a seed, if God determined everything by the disobedience and hard-hearted, hard-heartedness and stiff-necked people, If everything was determined and measured by them, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah, but thank God he left a seed. It was, he had a seed in view. He had a seed in whom he knew the whole. One seed governed his knowing of the whole. If he had not known that seed and known all in that seed, why could We've said it before. Why could there just be this small group of people left called Israel? And in God's view, Israel still remained untouched. Why? It it doesn't, didn't the losing of the many, didn't the losing of that great number, those who would not, let's say, those who wouldn't come out of Babylonian captivity, didn't God feel some loss there? No. What about though that generation that died in the wilderness? Did that affect anything as to God's view of Israel? No. Why? Because His view was always governed by the seed. was always determined in a seed. In one seed. One son. If it wasn't for that... We would be like a Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the thing? There is nothing righteous there. I'm destroying it. Nothing righteous. Nothing good. Describes the very state of man. In me dwelleth no good thing. No righteousness in me at all. If it wasn't for this seed being the determining factor and measurement and realization and sureness of our relation to God, we have no hope. We have no hope. The good news is that that seed is your life. That seed lives in you. That seed is made unto you all spiritual fullness. And we'll just end this class reading the rest of these verses. What then shall we say? That nations who are not pursuing righteousness did attain to righteousness, and righteousness that is of faith. 
And Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness at a law of righteousness, did not arrive. (laughs) Why? Because the one found it in the seed. The other did not. They pursued it by a law that declared this seed but would not come to the seed. It declared. You will not come unto me that you may receive the life of which it speaks. You just assume you have the life by reading it and applying it to yourself. Those who sought it by faith. You have to read all of these verses, the things that we've looked at, and we're going to go into another verse in the next class. We're out of time now. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, at a law of righteousness, did not arrive. Wherefore? Why? Because it was not by faith. But by works of law, for they did stumble at the stone of stumbling. According as it hath been written, Lo, I place in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and everyone who is believing thereon shall not be ashamed. The seed, as all through the testimony, never ultimately speaks concerning individuals or a multitude of people. It doesn't ultimately speak of a small remnant of Jews being left to preserve the race or the covenantal obligation that God had to them. It speaks of God's covenant cut with one seed who defines, who measures God's relation to the whole. There would be no hope, nothing at all for us. Unless everything for us was determined in, by, and as the one seed who lives in us. May our soul pursue the knowledge of that one seed. May we go continually to the Father. Say, Father, reveal in me the one who makes certain, who is the sureness, the surety of your relation to my soul. Well, we'll stop there. Amen.